Oh, How about now? There we go. Big voice. Okay, thanks, Don. Uh, so we're going to open it up to questions uh, again. Uh, as with the last meetings, we'll have mics to run around. So on this side, you can look for Chris, and on this side, I will be running around with this mic. So if you put your hand up, we'll make our way to you. And uh, I'd like to just make sure that we focus tonight on comments on if you have a general question about the flood recovery, uh, it's, it's great to hear those. Any questions about the uh, permanent flood protection works are also great. Um, if you're really upset, we, we like to hear your comments, but we would appreciate it if you direct your frustration at the event and not at the people that are up on stage. Or I think we have on my left some folks that are willing to bear the brunt of it. Is that right? No? Okay. Sorry, I caught them by surprise. Oh, Grace is moving on. Okay. At, at any rate, um, we will be, we have another, uh, oh, that clock is definitely wrong. <laughs> we have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. So we'll be running questions until uh, 7.30. So we should be able to get through uh, most questions tonight, if not all questions. And uh, with that, I think if Chris can find a hand on his side, we will go to the first question. Hi, it's What will a dike look like? We live on the river, and we didn't flood other than in our crawl space. Are we going to have something really high in front of us and we won't be able to see the river? So the, the height of the dike uh, will be coming out of the study that's been worked on right now uh, where the city has the consultants upgrading in their floodplain mapping because that will be the uh, determine what the height of that dike will be. The height of the dike in front of your property uh, will depend upon what the elevation of your property is. If you had a crawl space uh, and your crawl space did not get wet then you are likely fairly high already which suggests that uh, if, it, if there was a dike uh, that needed to be constructed, it would likely not be something that is going to look like uh, a great wall in front of your, your house. Uh, but, you know, I, that, that's the best I can tell you. The, once that, if that's the approach that is, is being used, once the design is, 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 is being finalized, uh, it will certainly be brought to the community by the city for, for you to review and have comments on. Um, Don, I think you just need to reiterate the... Yeah, the sorry. Oh, I think you got to hold it. The light needs to go on. Oh, he'll turn it on. I can just talk loud. I think you just need to reiterate to the folks that a dike going along the river needs to have about a 20 meter setback from the, the high water mark that's the natural bank of the river. So if your house is located right on where the river is eaten away, um, the provincial recommendation is that it be set back, which would require purchasing property, unless we can convince the provincial government to put that dike out into the river, which is not their recommendation. Houses will have to be bought out. I don't that, that's. I just wanted you to realize. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So thank you. That that that. I is, just want to be frank again. I mean, that's just yeah. That's an important uh, uh, recommendation of when we met with the provincial uh, folks from from the Dayton office. They indicated that uh, the preference in the construction of, the, of dikes is typically set back from the from the bank of the river for a variety of reasons, um, and and so it could be anywhere from zero to forty meters back, depending upon the location. Um, and uh, but that is that is a desire from them. It is not necessarily it is not a law, and it is something that that. You know, hearing comments, and you're not the first one to talk about that, and we all appreciate that. Uh, that is something that, that certainly needs to be given very serious consideration to the social impacts of the location of permanent protection works. Uh, excuse me. Uh, my name is Dr. McKay, and I live on the Riverside Drive. Uh, 
I've heard a rumor that they're going to build the dike right down the riverside. And I and I'm between the dike and the river where I where I live. It's um, I, have you looked at the the, uh, the possibilities of getting in and out of there? You know, if you, if you build the dike like I saw on the thing there down the riverside, how do I get in and out of my property? That's it, thank you. So, uh, raising Riverside Drive is, is one of the considerations that, that's been given. Uh, we have walked uh, the river around the city in, in Granby, uh, and one of the problems with the Granby, um, as you come from the highway down towards the mouth, is that uh, of properties, there is no room between uh, the bank of the river um, and residences or, or commercial buildings to build a dike, uh, build protective works in a practical way. And so the option that was looked at was the option of, of raising the drive. And there may be uh, some site-specific variations in, in whether it was uh, entirely Riverside Drive. Uh, your location may be one, I don't know it personally. Uh, but those sorts of things uh, would be looked at and if there was no practical way uh, that the street can be raised and, and your property would effectively be made unusable, then the recommendation would be that the uh, property was purchased from you. Up on that. Um, last meeting, there was a gentleman there that uh, his property value went down 50%. Is the same thing going to happen because I can't get access to my uh, my property? Um, council is advocating for those properties that we, we um, want or may have to purchase uh, is to ask for um, market price before the flood in addition to any funding that may have been put into repairing the, the building. Uh, our objective is for uh, your safety and your security, and that is our priority. Um, we know that this is going to be very, very disruptive to, to many of you. Um, I can only empathize, but Council is looking at all of the options. We are holding these meetings to get the feedback from those people who were affected. And I have to say that we were very, very pleased with the turnouts at the um, four meetings that we held. We held three yesterday and one today and now tonight. And this is going to help us as a council to make the right decision for the majority. Uh, as with anything, you can't please all of the people all of the time, but we are certainly working to do uh, what we can that's in your best interests and that of our city. And so we do appreciate um, your feedback. I would also say that there is going to be, as we advised the groups to, uh, in the previous meetings, there's going to be a questionnaire that's distributed by mail. We would ask to, to the impacted areas, not, not to the whole community, but just to those areas that were impacted. There's going to be a direct mailing. And we would ask that you complete it uh, and get it back so that the comments and the results can be analyzed and brought before council. We're hoping to be able to make some sort of a decision and an announcement on the 4th of September. So please be patient with us. We are working uh, towards, towards that end.
Yeah, if I, if I can just also add to that, um, that individuals are gonna have unique and specific situations and concerns and things that apply to them. And um, at the meetings, at the individual neighborhood meetings that we just had, there was a number that was given out. You can call Graham here. Um, and he will he wants to hear um, what your you know, specific concerns and needs are. And that number is 888-747-9119, right? Sure, so, uh, and, and the specific, uh, the survey going out will provide the opportunity to provide really good broad-based feedback and the chance that it'll actually get recorded. One challenge with that number is the number of calls it gets, plus the number of emails that the office receives. So definitely follow through with the survey thing. If within a week you have not received a survey, or if your concerns can't be addressed uh, with questions answered on the survey, I uh, will definitely have some follow-up, and I think uh, Mr. Gates will have some more information on that. Um, 888-747-9119. Hi, I'm the owner of Grand Forks on Harbor downtown. I just want to say the map up there. Um, we're pretty close to the city park. Uh, this year, we had a little bit of water in the warehouse they put a timer down in front of our store and kind of left us for the next also, which they probably would come. Now I'm, I'm hearing about a night being built. Uh, rumors have it. Uh, and I understand Jacques, he's in that same room as I am. Where is this night actually going to go? Is it going to go behind our building, behind the apartment building that is behind us? Like, your map is kind of. Pretty hard to read, can you tell us? The uh, line on the map was for illustration. The actual uh, configuration of the dike has not been has not been determined. There are complications such as the apartment building that you have and, and, and other buildings in that general area that uh, that have to be considered with regards to uh, where the alignment of that, that the, the dike will go. So that's all I can tell you right now. It, it don't don't take the line on the on the uh, on the slide as being the the engineer design. It is not used for illustration. Can I just say something? I think what Kathy wants to know is reassurance that the dike isn't going to run down 72nd in front of her store. <laughs> and that decision has not been made. So. Uh, I, I, Graham has walked it, I've walked it, and, 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 and there's lots of considerations that need to be made once you come down Riverside and swing across and we start going up the kettle. There are all kinds of considerations that need to be made with regards to the final design. Well, the final design, you guys going to take into consideration, um, I'm not the only business that's going to be affected by your decision. I know there's a lot of residences along that way too. And I hope before, I'm sorry, an engineer makes this decision that it's taken up with the Downtown Business Association and myself included, along with all the rest of the businesses and residents along that area. There has to be a solution that works for everybody, not cut the town in half, basically is what you're saying. So the intent is, is that uh, um, when the engineers go in to, to do the, the final determination of, uh, that would be in a recommendation that is made to city staff and on to council, that the city council and city staff and, and council will also have input in that. It's not an engineer's decision. It is a recommendation that is finally vetted through City staff and the decision and recommendation is supported by a, by a city council. So those are all going to be considerations that have to be considered. It's a complex issue. That's one of the reasons I put up on the slide that these solutions are not simple. They're complex and and they will take time to solve. And we need to consider all the. And if I might just add to that, Kathy, I, I hear your concern. Um, we want to work with the business community. Um, and 
no decision would be made without consultation in that regard um, with any businesses that may or may not be impacted. So uh, please rest assured there's not going to be a decision made um, without discussing it with you if it has an impact on your business. So I just, I hope that gives you some comfort. I can't say anything more than that, but um, we, we want to hear from you and we will be consulting with you uh, before any decision in that regard would be ever made. Thank you. so that as your counsel, we can make an informed decision. So please rest assured that it's not going to be just a, a show of hands on, on any willy-nilly idea. It's going to be well thought out, well researched, well debated, and uh, a, a, a decision made on an informed basis. Hi, my name is Adam. I'm, uh, I live down on the downtown core, adjacent to the next track. And uh, the council was mentioning that they're hoping to have some sort of resolution possibly in place to put to the public by the end of September. Will that resolution include layout biking as well? Because you said uh, previously that you don't have any of the actual layout of the decking put down in stone yet. So, so come September, we're hoping to have this resolution. Will the public have some knowledge as to that layout as well? Any decision made by council um, would be made public. It wouldn't be made in public, probably, but any decision um, would be made public. If I can add to that, the, the information that, that uh, council needs um, for the September meeting uh, are uh, the recommendations uh, based on the recommendations that are, are, to, are heard at the community meetings and the direction that is given to the recovery team with regards to those uh, specific actions that the council would like to move forward on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis with regards to the alignment of the dikes uh, and the protection of downtown. The protection of downtown with regards to costing out um, at, at a, a level that is required by council in order to build up the funds that they believe they need for the recovery are going to be um, what we might refer to as class E costs, which is they are going to include a con uh, considerable contingency uh, because the design will not be done by then. But we know in looking at downtown, because it's one of the easier ones, that if we're going to be building two kilometers of dike uh, in, in, in way that we talked about it 
uh, this evening in, in a general context of raising streets um, and so forth, we can put together those types of costs that is what council needs in order to, to build up the uh, request that we're going to be making to the province along with all of the other neighborhoods. The final designs are certainly not going to be done by September. They won't be done until sometime next year. It's going to be after the funding is in place. We have to get a response back from the province that if the city is asking for X tens of millions of dollars for its recovery and the province supports that, then the city can start moving forward, but the city doesn't have the money to spend out of its own pocket. It has to have the support of the province. That's where the design comes in. Yeah, thank you. And, and if I can just add, um, so the province is looking to us to give them some kind of an ask. So in order to do the best that we can for everybody involved, we have to make some fairly high level decisions about a way forward that are going to include some quote unquote specifics, but not all of these details. But if we wait until we get all of the answers to all of these details, we're going to be so far down the road that, I mean, you guys just, you know, there's not going to be the help that you need right now. So this is where we need your input, and I know it, you're, you're digesting this stuff, and how is it going to impact you, and what are the ramifications, and how are you going to move forward, but when we hear from the surveys and, and from the uh, meetings that we've already had, what we feel is the best direction to go forward with an ask, which is, um, I guess, somewhat generally specific, <laughs> Uh, then the details of that can be worked out. And that's where I think the individual uh, cases and scenarios are going to then have to be dealt with, you know, more on an ad hoc and individual basis. I hope I'm writing what I've said. Hi, I'm Nancy. I'm, uh, I'm in Johnson Flats. Uh, I was just wondering about the relocation. Like, what would that look like? Where would people go? And should we not be rebuilding just in case that is what's going to happen? Thank you, Nancy. Uh, so, uh, it's an excellent question. So, uh, starting with the first one, because the time is of the essence. Uh, right now, we know there's a, a housing shortage, real housing impacts. And people have, if, that, if their homes are near to a state of being safe, warm, and dry for the winter, and, that, and that's where the, they can be and see themselves being, that is the best, best option going forward. Uh, for those whose homes are unable to be uh, in for the winter, uh, the housing needs assessment absolutely needs to happen. You need to connect with that group. Um, for replacement homes, uh, whether there's locations where a dike or a flood uh, mitigation works are in, you know, the homes are in the way of that, uh, or if there's an area that's deemed unsafe um, through the various analysis, part of the plan will include options for replacement homes, not saying you are going over there or you are going over there, but what options will meet your needs? You know, are you looking to downsize? Do you need a garden? You know, do you want to be close to downtown or, you know, and, and how do we use the land based in the city and, and the area immediately around the city to help meet those needs and, and meet people where they're at. We also don't have any designs right now on the compensation and buyout program, but we're listening to how it could affect people and what interests they have. And, and I believe council's been clear about uh, the message that they put forward uh, about that. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Yeah, it's a very good question, and, and, and I refer back to the comments that I made earlier uh, with regards to the work that is being done uh, by Urban Systems in, in building a model that they will be using for updating the floodplain mapping, and that's exactly what that modeling is going to be showing us is what's the impact, and we can look at 
various options that uh, that we might be considering uh, and in, in building dikes or, or, or not building dikes and run those scenarios and see what happens downstream because what happens downstream is absolutely critical to, to the works that, that are, are done in, 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 in town and, and uh, uh, moving out of town and beyond. It's just a quick follow-up. Does that mean that uh, the buyouts or projects are going to be available to those communities as well? Because I remember in the last meeting it was made clear that that was going to be happening uh, outside the city on farm land. And uh, yeah, I'm just in a situation with a lot of folks and a lot of uncertainty and I, I don't know what What's on the table for us if that hasn't been addressed? Yeah, so there, there's a whole uh, similar range of, of, of options being considered with regards to damaged residences um, within the regional district. Um, and there's also consideration being given to uh, how to, what is uh, the best approach to uh, protecting farmland uh, and, and uh, uh, with a with a, a, a permanent solution, but it is not going to be one that's going to involve building dikes around uh, along the riverbanks uh, from the U.S. border down to to uh, Christina Lake. Uh, those considerations are being being some thought given to those as well. Um, I just, I don't have the details on any of that tonight. Yeah, there's a question down here. This gentleman has been sitting here patiently asking. Just for a second, could I add to that co sure. uh, conversation? Yep. Thank you actually for asking that question because from Christina Lake's standpoint, of course, we are uh, very interested in downstream. And, you know, our concern, and I know that you guys are all looking at this because we've had this conversation, is that if you encapsulate the river everywhere, what happens? It's got to go somewhere. Uh, it backs up uh, into Christina Lake is, is where a lot of it goes. So, yes, we have our concerns, and uh, I must say my people have been pretty doggone good about the whole process. So, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate bringing up that subject. Hi, I'm Rick Friesen, uh, North Fork Grove. Uh, I would like to know if your hydrological assessment included uh, areas north of the city of Grand Forks, and if they did that, uh, at what point in time will that information and assessment be available to the property owners up there? So, yeah, Randy, uh, the West Cattle, and the Christian Valley, the entire watershed. The regional district was was assessed at, at, at an overview level, uh, including the properties up North Fork Road and and, uh, and issues that were apparent from from our uh, our uh, overview assessment are going to be addressed in, in the report that will be provided to both the regional district and the city. I've got a, a follow-up, just piece of information as well. Um, there's, there's several areas with site-specific properties um, which were effectively, directly affected by flood erosion uh, where we put in a request to get uh, support for the follow-up um, follow analysis that's done specifically at those sites and upstream and downstream to see how, um, you know, either how, they, how, how staying there could affect them or if they can't, if they're looking at protective works, how that might affect the area. Um, it's it's the, the notion that no, no, there's an island involved in your case, but no site is an island and unaffected by upstream and downstream. So we're looking at additional engineering surveys that are done at those sites where river erosion has affected uh, rural neighborhoods or site-specific stuff. So that uh, uh, we'll be hearing on the funding shortly on that, and I believe that work will be underway and there will be consultation and specifically with the regional district, Mystery Transportation, and the landowners involved. Yes, yeah, so thank you. We, our family home was built in the late 50s on the north corner of Grandview Road and the highway. And over the years, we've suffered water damage to various degrees, though we did notice a lot more water damage 
uh, over the last few years when the dike was put in on Riverside Drive on the west side of the river only. A shock absorber, a floodplain is like a shock absorber and the dike was put in to protect uh, the Grand Forks downtown core, which it did protect, but it did sacrifice our side of the river. We've been patiently waiting here, both uh, Mr. Watts here and myself have been uh, waiting for a meeting, uh, neighborhood meeting for the Granby area, and we still haven't heard anything where we can make our concerns made to you people so that a proper decision can be made for our neighborhood as well. We were just wondering when we could receive something like that. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna start that process there, but um, also refer to Mr. Gates in terms in terms of community outreach. Um, there's some site-specific or, or uh, small neighborhood meetings being scheduled with residents on an individual basis when when there's a half dozen properties or so involved. Uh, that area specifically is on the list to address during this process. Um, the first starting point is is getting this uh, you know the information that will be going out. Um, providing feedback on that and uh, you know we'll be looking at an opportunity schedule we're doing the largest affected neighborhoods first and then we're following up site specific so there's been some industry meetings some business discussions started and we want to look at those other areas where there's you know several houses uh, in a row like yours that are that are affected so um, uh, Kevin and I will be following up with with the, the discussion here for scheduling something yeah, yeah just a follow-up with that uh, as, as you down. Thank you. As a follow-up, uh, just as uh, you folks have been mentioning, we're going to be making a decision or a preliminary decision regarding what's going to happen on September 4th, I believe, Chris? Okay. And we're now here the 8th of August. By the time it gets around to us, there won't be a lot of time for us to listen to what is being said. And a lot of times decisions are made before we even have input. We'd like to have something somewhat sooner than later. Thank you. If I could, um, I think there's some other areas too you'll be including, like um, uh, the advanced orchards and, and the memos. I, I, I've had calls from, from both of those people and the loss of land there uh, and the agriculture. So uh, I, you're not the only one, sir. You're, you're right. But I also know that, that these people have identified those conversations as well. Hello, Madam Chair Martin. It looks like uh, there is going to be a night put in to protect the downtown area from what I can see in that permanent line there. So if the property you own is on the riverside of that night on the downtown area, Yeah, and you, and that you're, you're absolutely right. That if, 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 if properties are made, if they cannot be given permanent flood protection uh, or are made unusable, then the recommendation is those properties be purchased. It's because I can see where you're pointing the arrow there. Our condo is on the peak of the, where the two rivers meet. And that looks like a big backwash right there, so I guess that's how the meeting goes. Thanks. Hi, my name is Dawn. Um, the water that came down from the flood, it happened from above in the watershed. Now, when we have trees, it slows down how the snow melts, so we don't have a whole bunch of water coming down quickly. I just wanted the residents to know that in a meeting with Johnson Flats, I had asked um, for the decision making come September that they consider how much logging has been done in our watershed where uh, heat or rain can maybe come down quickly. And my understanding is that they're going to make the decisions without that being considered. And I have great concerns because I've heard stories of a lot of logging 
die out there, and I'm concerned about risk to lives and property and us spending money and dikes not, not protecting us and houses not being um, built high enough. So I just wanted the people to know that that is not a consideration at this point, and I'm concerned. And if they, yeah. So, if we were to wait for the reports from the province for forestry and what what they're doing up there, we'd never have any fixes in the in the city, and we wouldn't be moving forward. This is a fluid situation, no pun intended. But whatever report we got, even if we got it tomorrow, would be different in six months or a year's time. So, whatever permanent uh, fix we did now, based on forestry reports would be changed in a year or two. So I'm not sure, I mean, the Kettle River management people have are looking at this, they are addressing this and they're dealing with the province with the forestry issue. It, it won't be impacting our decision at this point because we need to get moving and we need to get a, a resolution happening for the people of Grand Forks. Uh, I've got a follow up as well uh, to this. So. Uh, there's, there's two pieces. One, um, I've, I've heard from the province since the Johnson Flats meeting that there will be uh, a forestry uh, watershed information discussion. Uh, details to be forthcoming. I, I'm not sure uh, how that will be uh, facilitated and brought forward, but I believe there's going to be a discussion where they, they do want to talk with people uh, about, about this understanding, about the effects. The other component is this, this resolution on the 4th is, is about the overall direction. It's not about the height of the dike or the flood construction level, there's a floodplain study that involves detailed modeling that consider how the watershed behaves, um, you know, in terms of how it shows up down here, as well as climate change. So the engineering work that is, is brought forward considers how a floodplain functions and, and the best scientists uh, that we have available are, are, are looking at that. So um, the, the bottom line is that it's not out of scope for um, Think, thinking how floodplain works, it's out of scope for this recovery discussion to be looking at all of the upstream and downstream uh, components and intricacies. We're looking at moving forward on flood recovery and watershed behavior is certainly part of that. So. And, and also, if I can and just add to forestry practices, I know that there's a large concern in the community about forestry practices and um, there's a growing awareness maybe of how the practices over the years have been um, combining to make the situation that we're in now but whatever goes whatever happens in in that regard going forward and and I think there's enough uh, appetite and and input now that um, there's a focus on forestry practices people are going to be talking about best practices the province is going to have to be looking at maybe separating some of their ministries out so that um, they can you know maybe have a better balance on how these things are approached having having said all that nothing that is done today or tomorrow is going to fix what we need fixed for the next few years um, even a change in forestry practices tomorrow wouldn't significantly impact um, the water that's coming down because trees take a long time to grow but Donna, you've brought up a very good point, and I think a lot of people are, are aware of it. Um, I, would, I would just like to say that um, the decision that we're going to be making on the floor, hopefully, that we'll be in a position to make that, is to give the flood recovery team, Graham and, and, and his, his uh, people, some direction on which we see the city going. Um, we have grant applications that we have to, they have to submit. <clears throat> and they need to know what, as a council, we are looking for so they can start putting their numbers together. Um, this isn't going to be a quick fix. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, it, it could take uh, a, a year or two to get everything pulled together and all of the government agencies on board and, you know, these things, government works at a snail's pace, I'm sorry, it, it, it really does, including local government, provincial government, and federal government. And uh, 
Uh, but we want to make the right decision for our community. And that's what we're working towards. And I know that Grace and Roy, for their area uh, areas, also want to make the right decisions for their communities. So, uh, that thank you, Chris. Can I can I add a comment? My, sim my the simplicity of this is: how many of you right now who have an affected house and have been directly involved in that flood are willing to wait for at least two years to even get? a plan started because that's what it'll be so we're not here to debate forestry regardless i know uh, most of us want to debate forestry most of us do it's one of our prime things but this is not the time the time right now is to work with you people who are so affected some of you not didn't even have a bed so let's not get lost let's not take the wrong turn here Let's, let's continue to stick together like we have been for this last hour and having good conversations on what can happen with this plan and giving your input to the people who have to make it. And uh, and with the intent of 
of uh, undertaking action to, to reduce the impacts of those jams. As far as the in-stream window, um, I'm not sure what the ministry's position is on extending that. And will that survey be done up to North Fork, or will that survey be reported on on that September 4th meeting? The, that's a regional district uh, issue, not a, not a city issue. The, the um, specifics that were identified, uh, specific log jams and areas that were identified that should require further assessment, um, will be identified in the general report that will be submitted to both the regional district and to the city. Just as the note taker, there's one meeting uh, where I recall that there was an indication that the fish window could, it's, it's not completely impossible for it to be extended. So, so if you didn't hear, and there was an indication from uh, Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations, and uh, uh, Rural Development, that they would consider extending that window. Yeah, well, I'm Jim, I live in the same condo that Norm's just talking about, the one at the River Forks. I'm just wondering if we get placed on the water side of the dike, what's going to be the time frame that we're supposed to be, I, I'm assuming that we will be bought out. What's the time frame that we'll have to find new places? As there's 15 of us in there, so, and 18 in the other condo, if it affects that, plus all the houses in between. So. What will happen after the decision is made? And how long will we have to vacate the premises and be separate? So the, the, the engineering and build timeline of, of any dike is a long time, a couple of years. The compensation and buyout program, we also don't have any information on, on how exactly that will proceed, but that will be A, well in advance of the, uh, you know, the dike construction itself, and B, it won't happen until there are alternatives prepared. So as we discussed earlier, people have different preferences about where they'd like to go and the city planning and engineering needs to be in place so that there's alternatives ready and that there's a smooth transition for everyone that's potentially affected. Um, I did want to reiterate what I have heard from uh, a lot that as much of downtown as possible is, is under consideration and that's the message that's being put forward for how it's going to happen. Of course the line hasn't been drawn yet. Um, there will be further consultation before any decision is made about the final, the final step. Mm -hmm. Hi, I live downtown, behind Home Hardware. I live halfway between Home Hardware and the river, and I'm guessing if a dike goes through there, I might be bought out. Um, as I sit now at the present, um, I've already started working on my house so I can move back into it before winter. I bought materials and as I understand, if I'm correct, you say that uh, I won't know until the spring, until funding comes through, if, if my property will be bought out. Now, will I be reimbursed for the materials and work I'm putting into it now in order to get back into it for the winter where I build it out. I can't stay there for the winter. Well, if I might say to that, um, the city and council is advocating that any purchase and buyouts would be at the before flood uh, a value, market value, and that any expenditures, I would encourage you to keep your receipts um, to bring your house up to, so that you can have the winter in there, so you're, you know, warm, safe, and secure. Um, then that would be, um, we would advocate for those costs to be reimbursed as well. And um, if you have received DFA funding, um, for, for your, uh, if you were accepted and, and given money for that, that is not part of the buyout. 
that um, you would not have to refund uh, those costs to DFA. So I hope that responds adequately to your question. Yes, it does, and thank you very much, Councillor. Okay, we have time for a few more questions here. So I've got a written question from a resident. Uh, how long will it take to start uh, the clearing out of properties in the North Rockwell area? And I'm assuming that is in relation to a buyout? Yes, in relation to a buyout. Um, we don't have a, a confirmation of funding of the timeline for the approach. Um, if there's, uh, you know, what we, what we hear is that it can take two to four years for something to be built. I think we want to look forward to uh, refinement of the timeline uh, as we get into this fall and probably confirmation by the spring. So getting your house back to habitable condition could be really helpful for some time. Yeah, my name is Mel and I live right on the river and I'm wondering why with all the type of machines we have nowadays, you couldn't start your day over the edge of the bank a little bit so you don't have to be as destructive to all the buildings that are there. Um, they got reaches on these big holes and put rocks up in the middle of the river if you want. And as far as digging a hole is concerned, uh, you can do that just about any place you like. Yeah, the issue is, is not about the uh, capabilities of the equipment or the size of the equipment. And yes, we do have some excellent technology these days. Um, the Kettle River and the Grand River are both fish streams. We have to deal with with uh, multiple resources in those streams, and and uh, um, the um, type of direction that we get from the province uh, is that that we have to consider public safety, but we also have to consider the ecosystem and its balance in that, and where we can protect both in, a, in an acceptable manner. That's what we aim to do. Uh, it certainly, uh, we built, uh, when I started in my career many years ago, that's what we did, was we built right on the riverbanks, and I built 100 miles of dikes from, from uh, Chilliwack all the way to Steeston. And now what's happening is they are now moving those dikes back because that's not where they should be. And, and uh, so we've learned something over the years and where we can set them back, we try to set them back. Where they, there is no option and they have to be on the river bank. Yes, they can still be on the river bank, but there also is, a, and it's, it's a federal mandate, which is with regards to a compensation program. Uh, with regards to if you destroy a square meter of fish habitat, then that fish habitat has to be replaced somehow. So, uh, and that gets difficult. So we try to avoid that when we can. A follow-up to that, you talked about the fish, but I know since I moved down the river, the river has gotten so low, so fast, that the water has warmed up and in a few fish that I've seen beside my bank, are laying their gas in there because the water is too warm for them to get sufficient oxygen. So they're dying anyway. So it would make sense to me to do a one-time thing and dig your trench and dredge the river and make it deep, put your dikes in where they have to, and then let the fish come back. Yeah, well, there's no, no question that uh, on days like today, um, fish aren't the only ones that are suffering out there. And, um, but the reality is the, we deal with, with the laws as they are, and the laws are what they are, and that's what we work with. Okay, can I get a, a quick show of hands? Just uh, how many people still have, have questions? Uh, so another five, six. So we'll probably go a little bit over that, probably 15 minutes over. Uh, of course, some people have already left, and if you need to leave, uh, feel free, but uh, we will go a few minutes over to get some of these last questions. From East Island Gardens Road. Uh, I understand this meeting is more about town um, and all this uh, financial assistance and financial support and diets and everything. Uh, but did you have any study on our side, the north side, and north side, and uh, ask them on the garden side? And, um, and 
does her looking into the same financial support from anywhere else? So the areas uh, like almond gardens in 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 the I can't wait um, two three years. Uh, How's it going to be in the river? And if yours is one of those houses that there is certainly an urgency to a couple of homes down there with regards to what's coming at you next year, um, which could be the same as this year. And so, yes, they are being looked at and it's part of the recommendations that are being put forward to the regional district. If I can, um, if you cross the border at Laurier and you head down toward Colville, you'll see the banks of the kettle and a lot of erosion, huge erosion. And not unlike your house, one of them, part of it, went right over the bank, the other part was sitting very precarious. They've moved that whole house back. Yeah, my property doesn't have place and to they, move it back. They've done a very, very good job of it. So there's a couple homes along there that, you know, maybe that's an option, I don't know, but it, they sure did a nice job of it. And, and, and I, I think what you just, I heard you say is you don't have room to move that I have only 30 feet. Yeah, so the, there are engineering solutions that, that uh, are being considered and, and will be, those options will be presented to the, to the board for, for its consideration, um, as well as purchasing the property and, 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 and making the lot non-residential. Because if you, can't, if you can't be safe there, then you can't be safe there. Can determine. Right. So, but uh, there may be uh, an engineering option that, that that the board would like to pursue that uh, that, that that may uh, affect you uh, being able to do um, Another question: Is any idea when we're going to have meetings for us? Okay. The, the report that, that that I'm working on right now is a is a report for the entire Kootenai Boundary Regional District area that I was asked to address. And, and, and the report is going to both the board and the council, and, and they need that uh, before the end of the month. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jessica Lee. I'm from the video and don't have internet access. Les Johnson, of course, is filming the meeting and that will be up on watch anything on the internet they want. I see them watching YouTube videos all the time. So it will be online and people can come down to the library and watch it there. It's the best I can do. I mean, I could make DVDs, but then people would have to have a DVD player in a place to watch it and stuff. And not everybody has to. What's your okay. website? So support your local library. Go down and uh, watch the footage of the next video. Hello, my name is Jess. No, no, I just had a question about your overall assessment of the watershed. It just strikes me as we're focusing on specific Grand Forks issues. We're not talking about North Fork, Christine Lake, further upstream. So I'm just wondering if there's anything on dry dam reservoirs, the diversion canals, and anything in Calgary or Winnipeg have other options, flood mitigation. And the second part of my question is, how confident are you or your profession on the value of historical data going forward to establish this 200 year flood level or the 500 year flood level and what that is, it just strikes me as a possibility that all this effort gets done and the calculations are right. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts were on that and what your report may or may not have had time to address. It just seems to focus on one piece and missing maybe the big picture. Yeah, good question. And so the first part is, 
tonight's meeting that I was asked to prepare for was the meeting to address the issues within the city. Uh, but I am also addressing the issues outside of the city as well in the regional district. So, and those will be covered off in, in, in your report when it's, when it's presented. With regards to your next question, which was, did we look at things like floodways, like the like, uh, Red River floodway around Winnipeg and so forth? Uh, we did a cursory review of, of, of an option to do that, and it uh, would involve moving somewhere in the neighborhood of about 700 to uh, a million cubic meters of material. Uh, and the anticipated timeline to get an approval on something like that, because it becomes a major, major project in this country, is probably a decade or more. So we, as much as that might be a, a wonderful idea, uh, with regards to the needs of the people in the room and, and, and within the regional district, that's not something that uh, was worth pursuing at that point. With regards to the veracity of the data, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is a, a, a we're in an absolutely intriguing time. I've been in this business for over 45 years and, and I've never seen a more exciting time than what we're in right now as, as somebody who works in, in water resources and, and flood planning because um, the historical data is of interest and some guidance, but you cannot rely on historical data to give you guidance into the future. So as a profession, uh, we are very aware of that and uh, I've worked on other projects where uh, the client, uh, and, and the client in this case would happen to be the provincial government, uh, it wanted an update on the 200-year on the floodplain or flood flow for a, a large stream, and it wanted uh, it consideration of climate change in it as well. And the firm that, that did that uh, did their best. Um, and the best that they could come up with at, at that point was by increasing it by a percentage uh, based on the, the data that they had to that point in time. It's, it's, it's a real challenge, let me tell you. I mean, in, in this business right now, uh, we don't have 50 years of record. Uh, that gives us guidance that we've had in the past. We might have 15, and we might have 10. And we've got to come up with a 200 year flow out of that. So we've got to use judgment, and, 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 and we've got to use the best information and guidance that we can, but we're well aware of, of, of what your concern is, and, it, and it's very real. If I can add to that, thank you very much for actually caring about all the rest of us as well. Um, there has been numerous conversations at Christine and Lake. Uh, the uh, hydrologist came out and walked the Cray Creek. We had a meeting with that. We've had a public meeting on flood and fire with an overview. Uh, there's a couple things Christina Lake really wants, and that's a hydrological a study done on Christina Creek and a gauge, a permanent gauge put in so that we can tell when that creek starts going backward and it'll give us a, a little better feel. Some of those gauges were there years and years ago and they were pulled out, unfortunately. So the data just isn't there for them to rely on, but, but, but thank you for that. In the Dry Dam Reservoir, there's no option to the North Fork or the North Granby River or anywhere else around, and maybe up um, West Bridge or Christine, Christine. But like some, you just have to take the peak off of this. Right? Yeah. So, uh, it, it, it's a good question, and because I knew you were going to ask it, I had already worked it out. <laughs> I was reading your mail. <laughs> so we looked at restoring the dam up on the Granby that, uh, that was there at, at the smelter site. And, and because it, it, it had a reservoir already and, and, and so on and so forth. And it was a simple one and, and a reasonably good site to, to start with. So what I did was I ran the analysis uh, on um, if we were to take about 100 cubic meters per second off just the peak day of the flood. And uh, a, it was either a three or a four meter uh, high structure that I used and it took something like eight hours to fill it. Um, 
So then I looked at uh, saying that's pretty exciting um, and doesn't do a heck of a lot of good for anybody downstream. So then I said, well, what about how high would the dam have to be if what we did was we actually took, we did not allow the Granby River to exceed downstream of the smelter site 100 CFS during the 2018 flood. 2018 flood peaked out on the Grand Via about 300 cubic meters per second. So I looked at the hydrograph and the number of days from where it crossed over 100 to where it came back down to 100. And it would require a structure 29 meters tall and it would have stored about 100 million cubic meters of water. So, uh, good questions, uh, but we don't have an area, and, and, and if you talk, if you moved up on either, you know, the West Kettle or, or the, the Christian Valley or wherever, uh, and tried to build a structure, the costs are, are just astronomical to build a structure that, that would actually take the type of peaks off that we need taken off. Okay, so we're coming up to the last question of the night here. Uh, so we'll go one more here and we'll be closing out. Hello, uh, we lost our house in South Rockland, so I have a bit of a statement and then a question at the end. Uh, there's a lot of talk about cutting the trees and how that's affecting the water flow. Uh, I was raised in Grand Forks and when I was a kid, uh, 58, 59, 62, 65, 67. Uh, there was flooding throughout the valley. A uh, rock addition down by the river always got flooded. The bank along the railroad track on the map that you showed the red portion, that always got flooded. It was always full of water through the spring. City Park always got flooded. The bridges got washed out uh, into town here. Uh, a couple of times they were rebuilt. Uh, so, logging may have some effect, but certainly we've had this type of flooding for many years, although not as severe, and we have to remember that we had a, a very high snowfall uh, that had a bearing on the amount of water we got to, and the right conditions for the right amount. When council does decide what they're going to do with South Rockland or North Rockland, uh, there are people that want to stay there. but. There are a lot of people that don't want to stay there. We don't want to stay there because in order to rebuild Rockland property, you have to raise it probably eight to 10 feet. Council would have to consider bringing in city sewer, sidewalks, sidewalks that were promised in 1970 when they amalgamated Rockland Edition, and the sewer system that never showed up on that side. You have to spend probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars by the time you finish everything with the dikes and rebuilding all of these areas. I don't see that as a logical thing to do. The most efficient, cost effective, and safe thing to do is to move the people out of there, put them on higher ground. Perhaps the city has lots of able or they can develop a subdivision. You create an economy within Grand Forks while this is being done, you maintain your community instead of people leaving the community because who wants to live there now in, in the island of Rockless? Uh, the buildings that will be left behind shouldn't leave it the way it is. And the people who don't rebuild, somebody has to take those buildings down, those buildings down. Who's going to do that? I don't think a lot of the owners that are going to leave are going to do that. You'd be smarter to just walk away and leave everything. It would be in your best interest. So, is council going to consider that if they do reconstruct the ruckles, are they going to bring in all the proper services and make it a viable community? Or are we going to just landfill and, and throw houses on top of it and, and move forward? Um, that is my, my main question on that part. I would like you to just buy me a somebody wants to stay let them stay. Uh, I, I, I've been here since 1957 myself, so it's 61 years. I remember some of the floods you're talking about. Um, and I can remember one of the floods coming up 
uh, Riverside Drive to uh, what I would call the gray building, that's uh, it's the apartments now. Um, people, it's not going to be an easy decision. It's not going to be an easy decision for council to make when we know that there are people who really, really, really want to stay in their homes and don't want to move because they love them, they put their life into it. We are going to make a decision that we believe is in the best interest of the community as a whole. And there are mechanisms and ways that um, are uh, things that are available to, uh, to the city if, if a property owner um, doesn't want to uh, agree to a, <clears throat> a bio. I would sincerely hope we don't have to come to that because that's an ugly process and uh, uh, nobody comes out of it on that. So be assured, <coughs> assured that <coughs> any decisions that we as a council make, we're going to make in the best interest of the community as a whole. Okay, so we're at the end of uh, tonight. We will be having another meeting, you guessed it, in two weeks. Uh, same time and likely the same place, depending on the turnout. We're considering going to the bistro instead of here, but uh, stay tuned on that. And do we have party words from Vester McGregor? Uh, you do. Thank you. This was one of the best meetings I've attended, uh, other than ones at Christine Lake, of course. Uh, you guys rock. You really do. You, you dialogued. You gave us what we need. It, it isn't easy for you or for us, quite frankly. And would we really want to have to do this? No. But I want to thank you tonight for your decorum, for your conversation, and for all being here. Because you've been here over and over and over. So thank you very much. All right, the only thing I'll add to that is that the sooner everyone clears out, the sooner the young guys are moved and go home and we've been left the door. So uh, uh, I'll be direct, but maybe not rude, but uh, if they have discussions, it's a lovely night outside.